Uh, so welcome to Ion Trinidad and Tobago, part of uh, ICT Week. I guess we're just calling out next slide. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, they don't give me any electronics. All right. Um, yeah, so, so thanks again. Uh, before we start, I want to talk a little bit about the deployment and operationalization team, which is the small team within the Internet Society that uh, puts on these ION events. Next slide. Um, first, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Internet Society. The Internet Society um, really is focused on ensuring that the Internet reaches all people everywhere. That we can kind of keep the Internet free, open, and growing. Um, and the next slide. The Internet Society really focuses on doing this in, th in three main ways. Uh, policy, working with uh, regulators and policymakers around the world to help ensure that uh, the regulations and laws that are made don't interfere with the way the Internet works. The development side, which works on human capacity development, training, and also infrastructure development. We work with building out IXPs and many things all over the world. And then the technology, I, technology side, uh, which our team is a part of, works on um, developing and promoting technologies around the world. Next slide. The Internet Society itself was kind of created uh, as the secretariat for the IETF, but since then has grown very, very widely. On the next slide, you can see we now have, uh, I think, something like over 65,000 members. Um, yeah, the next slide, please. Um, over 100 chapters, over 140 organizational members. Uh, we have five regional bureaus that cover most of the world um, and have really just, you know, really expanded in the last few years to take on this mission of ensuring that the Internet's for everyone. Uh, within that, the, our team, uh, myself, Dan York, Megan Cruz, and Jan Zors, myself and Megan are here this week, um, work on the deployment and operationalization team. Really, we're looking at operator outreach, trying to take technologies uh, from the IETF out to the operators, having the operators talk to each other, and uh, also bringing input from the operators back into the IETF. On the next slide. You can see uh, our, our three main projects that we work on. Um, the one I'm going to talk about right now is Deploy360. And then also, we also work on efforts around best current operational practices and uh, operators in the IETF. So the next slide starts to dig into the Deploy360 program. And again, thanks. Really what we're trying to do with the Deploy360 program is address the gap in knowledge between IETF standard protocols and actual deployment experience. So the IETF does a really, really good job of designing and, and um, standardizing all of the protocols we use on the internet. Uh, however, what they write for is hardware and software developers that are building these protocols into devices and equipment. And so then there's a gap between actually building the protocol itself in a device and deploying that protocol on a real network. And we try to bridge that gap by working with fast ad uh, first, first adopters, the folks who deploy these technologies right out of the gate, collecting their experiences, their lessons learned, and then sharing that with the fast followers and everyone else who, who needs and wants to deploy these technologies. Good. We do that in kind of four main ways. We have a website, the Deploy360 website, which is kind of the heart and soul of this project. It's where all of the resources live, the case studies and tools. We uh, extend that through social media really to provide a feedback loop. We also have uh, speaking engagements where we go out in person to talk to folks. And then, of course, the ION conference series itself, which is where we're at today. The next slide looks at the web portal itself. Um, we have the content divided in two different ways. It's by topic. Right, we, right now, we work on IPv6, DNSSEC, TLS, anti-spoofing, and secure BGP are the five topics we're looking at to help make the internet stay relevant, um, stay resilient, be more secure, and, and keep growing. Uh, and so there's, there's content for all of those different topics. But then also, we've split up the content by audience. So if you're a content provider, if you're an enterprise, if you're an IXP operator, if you're a policymaker or regulator, there is information hopefully suited directly to you on all those things. We also have a blog there where we keep uh, news and, and events streaming all the time. And then again, the social media integration, which is on the next slide as well. We try to be all places on social media, or at least as much as possible. And really the idea here is to create a feedback loop. We want to be able to conversate with you. We want to know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what more we can do for you, what we can do to help. And so uh, these are ways for you to talk back to us and let us know those things. On the next slide. Uh, and then speaking engagements, of course, let us do that on a bit more personal basis, where we can actually show up at events, are able to share our expertise, 
and then take information back again. And the next slide talks a little bit more about the ION conferences. Obviously today we're here at ION Trinidad and Tobago. Um, just actually a couple of weeks ago we were in Sri Lanka, for ION Sri Lanka, and we had four events last year. We've so far been to, I believe it's 13 cities now on five different continents. So we're really trying to hit as wide of an audience as possible with the ION conference series to engage multiple audiences in multiple parts of the world and really ensure that these key technologies are adopted everywhere. Next one. So our next steps are to continue adding more content, right? We want to provide as much information as we can, all of the tools you need to deploy these technologies. So we're going to continue to try to scour the experts around the world and have them document these things or, or just link to their documents that are already there. We're going to add features based on your feedback and we're going to do all of this based on your feedback. And so if you uh, go to internetsociety.org slash deploy360, you can take a look at what's already there. If you happen to be an expert, if you happen to be someone who's deployed one of these technologies, right, if it's IPv6, DNSSEC, TLS in your application, uh, anti-spoofing, or if you're secured to BGP, we'd love to hear about it. We'd love to share your story uh, with other folks who would, who would need to hear it and learn from it. Uh, and also new features. Right? If there's tools or certain things, uh, you know, you could say, I, if I, I could deploy this if just this one thing was there, you know, let us know. Maybe we can help create that. Our email address is deploy360 at isoc.org. And as I said, we're also on all, all the social media, and we look forward to feedback on any of those. Um, so that's a little bit about the Deploy360 team and, uh, and when we put on these ions. Um, are there any, first, I guess, are there any questions? Okay. Yeah, please. I think there, there may be a microphone on some of the tables. There's one. Um, Steve Spence. Um, I, I'm curious about what the acronym I am. What does it mean? Uh, it originally stood for Internet On, like turning the Internet on, um, but now it's just simply ION. It doesn't really stand for anything anymore. It's just the name of the conference. A good question. Thanks. Anything else? All right, great. Thanks and welcome again. Now I want to welcome um, Niran Bahari who is uh, going to speak on behalf of the Internet Society Trinidad chapter, the local chapter of the Internet Society. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm here to give you a warm welcome and greeting to the ION conference this evening. Uh, um, my role has been delegated to telling you a little bit about the local chapter. The Trinidad Tobago chapter of the Internet Society was formed approximately two years ago, officially. We existed in some form or the other, but we actually created the chapter two years ago. We have focused most of our local activity mainly on consulting with government as well as other um, NGO bodies towards the adoption of open standards for free and open internet for all. We have been lucky that we are, the government has actually been embracive in a lot of these proposals. So we were asked and we consulted in the Trinidad and Tobago Cybersecurity Act, for example, um, the Internet and um, Exchequers Act, as well as the E-Commerce Act. And we were quite happy and proud to be asked and to give our input into the writing and formalization of these acts. Uh, we also do community outreach in goals of increasing awareness. So for one project we have is Safety T, which we are, well, we are attempting to get it to work with the Ministry of National Security. Um, but we all know how things are going right now, politically so. <laughs> um, but the goal, really, of that is to create a portal where teens and young persons can come and get information about cyberbullying, online trolling, and these other issues. Eventually, we hope, and this is the reason why we are looking to do it with the Ministry of National Security, um, to provide a feedback mechanism where these young persons have an environment where they feel safe, where they can come and report these incidents. Uh, more often than not, uh, it falls towards the monitors and so on in the education system and you know, it does, don't work as well. You know, they, 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 they fear repercussions. Um, apart from that, 
uh, we attend the region, we host the regional IGF hubs along with the CTU um, and the Bigger Computer Society. Um, we hosted the ITF, uh, IETF um, in March. And we hope to continue to build on those collaborations. Right now, you know, we have mainly two main societies representing computer society users in Trinidad, one being ISOC, TT, the other one being the Computer Society. And we have, we have a well-working collaboration in that regard. Um, Trinidad being a small country, dividing up resources is not really a very smart idea. Um, apart from that, we attend, we attempt to represent Trinidad and Tobago in the global IGFs and ICANN conferences. Um, more often than not, you would find that we fall within the Latin American group and for our voices as Caribbean countries to be heard, you know, we have to be very vocal. Um, a fact I actually did not appreciate until um, I attended one in July in London. You know, so um, I actually have a bit better appreciation now of, you know, um, some of the hassles and trials that um, some of my associates go through. And, um, you know, they, they would be literally attending these conferences two, three, four times a year. It gets up, it gets up, honestly, I can understand now when they say they're a bit tired, <laughs> um, how it comes to play, you know, but, you know, that being said, it is a very rewarding experience to know then that, you know, as a country of our size, we have actually implemented policies or helped implement policies that have reflected on a global scale. And that's not something that you, you hear of, you know, every day. Um, apart from that, you know, being a young society, we don't really have that much of a history, so um, this is going to be pretty short. <laughs> but we are always looking at new members, you know, if you're interested in joining, you can go to our website, uh, www.isoc.tt. Uh, uh, you can also register through the ISOC Global website, and then you select which chapter you want to go to, and you can select Trinidad and Tobago. Or if you, any of you are interested, you can just um, talk to me afterwards. Any questions? At present, we have 125 members. Actually, we did have um we did have a conversation with Tat in the, when we started the project, and they actually were very quite instrumental in providing us with a, quite a bit of information when we now started. So, yes. Okay, that's it. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, next up, we're going to dive into some of the more technical content of the conference here tonight. Um, the business case for DNSSEC, I'd like to ask uh, Patrick Hossein from TTNIC to come up and talk about uh, DNSSEC and why it makes sense to deploy it now. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, can you bring up my uh, slides? I assume you have my slides, right? Yes. So I'll be, I've, I've, I've been asked to talk about the business case for DNSSEC. <clears throat> uh, DNSSEC is a very technical topic, but I've toned down as, as much as I can uh, to give you a, a, an understanding of, of what it tries to uh, achieve and why you as a, uh, well, not you, but businesses um, should deploy it. Yes.
DNSSEC. DNSSEC business case. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so my name is uh, Patrick Hossein. Uh, I am with uh, TTNIC. TTNIC manages the .tt domain. <clears throat> uh, next slide. If you need to get in touch with me, you can get me at, at this address, admin at nic.tt. Uh, I also have like you know other addresses you could um, <laughs> Patrick at Hossein.tt is also easy to remember. Um, okay, next, please. Okay, so overview, I'll um, I'll talk about which parties are affected by DNS tech. Uh, DNSSEC actually stands for Domain Name System Security Extensions, uh, and, I, and I'll explain a little bit of what, what, what that is. I'll give a quick introduction to DNS, um, the uh, flaws in DNS, and the reason for introducing DNSSEC to address those flaws. <clears throat> uh, simplified introduction to DNSSEC, and uh, some discussion on, on uh, the business case. Next, please. Okay, so the, uh, <clears throat> DNS, the, the participants that are affected by DNSSEC are uh, registries. Registries are, the, um, uh, are those who manage the dom domains. Uh, in our particular case, we are concerned about uh, CCTLDs. Uh, so we, uh, so yeah, so uh, TTLing manages the .tt domain uh, in the case of Trinidad, uh, there's only one, one uh, registry. We have no registrars. So in terms of convincing registries and registrars on, on the business case with DNSSEC, there's only one to do. Uh, and and uh, uh, TTNIC has already deployed uh, uh, DNSSEC. Uh, in fact, we've done it. We did it like about three years ago. So there's no convincing there. Um, then they're, they're the registrants. These are the people who apply for domains. And um, so they would also need to uh, support DNSSEC. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why there are several parties who need to, to be involved in, in supporting DNSSEC for it to work. You know, you just can't have some parties uh, deploying it or, or um, supporting it and other parties not supporting it because uh, it's uh, it's uh, the weakest link in that chain is is what is important, and so all parties have to be involved in supporting it. The uh, third, um, so registrants, especially the banks, government, um, the university, um, and the major incentive uh, for these uh, parties would be the um, securities. Yes. Then ISPs have to support it. They have to provide uh, DNSSEC resolvers. Um, Basically, the ISPs are the ones, you know, you are uh, as a customer of an ISP, you depend on them to provide certain services for you. One of those services is, is doing this uh, domain name lookup, which we'll talk about in a while. Um, but they would have to um, support DNSSEC in, in that uh, lookup process as well to protect you. And finally, you, the end user, would have to use the software um, that um, includes DNSSEC, DNSSEC support. Next, please. So in, in summary, about well, the business case, you know, the companies, uh, government institutions are, are concerned about cybersecurity. And DNSSEC is one weapon in this fight. Of course, it's not the only weapon. You, you need to do several other things. One, you know, one, one step even before this is SSL certificates. 
um, many of our local uh, sites do not have SSL certificates. Um, unfortunately, not even the government uh, website has a, a, an SSL certificate. So this is a major issue we need to address before we even get to the NSA. All right, the NSA provides a certain portion of, of the, um, the, the, the transaction, but you need to have the, the actual uh, transaction itself protected. Uh, competitive advantage, you know, ISPs and banks, once they introduce the NSSEC, they can use it to differentiate themselves from others. You know, if a bank can say, well, I, I have a DNSSEC um, deployed, so I'm, I'm safer in terms of um, uh, fraudulent activity than other banks, similarly for ISPs. And then there's the potential for deployment of new security products. Uh, we, you know, we can develop um, our own uh, niche market in developing some of these products. Ne next, next. So let me get down to what DNS is because, you know, talking about what we need to do in terms of business case doesn't matter unless you know what DNS is. And so I've simplified the, um, you know, the, the, the um, discussion here. So, all right, so com computers c communicate via numbers called IP uh, addresses. Uh, example, 2.208. Dot 109, etc. In the same way that phones communicate via numbers, right? So you use a phone, phones only talk um, from number to number. Same thing with, with the internet, it's a, a number to a number. In the case of uh, phones, you, you map a name to a number by actually, you know, you have a, a, a directory or you have a phone book, whatever. Of course, with, with, um, with cell phones now, it's much easier. Um, <clears throat> but in the case of, uh, so we, we actually do it manually. Now humans prefer using names um, than numbers. Um, and so the internet has the ability to do this uh, map mapping automatically or transparently for you. All right, so the internet, the DNS uh, service uh, th does this mapping. So if you take www.nic.tt, uh, what you type into your browser uh, would be that. That's the uh, string. But um, what the computer actually needs to connect to is an IP address, and that address is this 28.109.123.225. That mapping from the name to the address is what DNS, uh, DNS does for you transparently. All right? So that, in a nutshell, is what DNS is. It's a service that provides a mapping from the um, easy names that you can remember to the IP addresses, the actual uh, addresses of the machines that uh, provide the uh, service. Uh, next. So a simple example is if it, in your browser you type www.gov.tt, your computer asks another server, typically um, one provided by your ISP, it asks that server to actually find the IP address, that number for you. Um, your ISP's name server sends out various queries on the internet, obtains that uh, required information and retains it to the computer. So this mapping that I mentioned, it, it doesn't happen on your laptop it, or, or, or your client, it happens out on the internet. And that's the whole DNS process. Uh, next, next please. And so this is a simplified example. Um, it's a, you know, a, a lot more complicated, but as I said, I took the liberty to simplify things. So first is the, your laptop, for instance, um, ask the question, you know, well, resolve www.gov.tt, or, or in other words, tell me what's the IP address uh, that I need to connect to to get to www.gov.tt. That, um, that goes to your local ISP's uh, name server, or, or which, which then does the actual work. It first sends a query to something called a root name server, um, asking, well, how do I get to this, uh, how do I get this IP address? The root server would say, well, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how to, to get the IP address, but I can tell you where to get to name servers that would are, uh, um, be able to resolve anything under .tt, all right? So then the query then goes to, um, uh, to, to 
to the name servers provided by this root server for .tt. Um, in this case, it goes to, let's say it goes to this write.mic.tt. It asks the same question, you know, uh, IP address for www.gov.tt. And, and uh, uh, the write.nic.tt uh, server says, well, I can't give you the answer, but I could tell you who handles gov.tt names. So then it, it, it uh, responds with that. Then the ISP name server then sends a request to one of these uh, gov.tt name servers, which has the answer. So it now provides the answer back, the actual IP address, and this gets all the way, forwarded all the way back to the um, client. So that in a nutshell, as I said, is how DNS works. Okay, um, next. So what is the problem? The problem is can, can we trust the various actors involved in the lookup? As you can see, there are several parties involved, several machines, several communication links. So if servers or the communications uh, are compromised, then uh, the computer can, can receive incorrect information. Uh, you know, suppose somebody plants in, uh, in, in incorrect information in that response, one of those responses. Um, then the, the IP address you get back will be incorrect and you will be connected to uh, the wrong machine without knowing. All right, so this incorrect address will take you to a, a an attacker's fake site. So the, uh, an attacker, for instance, if it could, if it could intercept somewhere around, uh, along that process, if it could insert its IP address instead of the correct IP address, then uh, you get the in wrong information and you get to the wrong site without knowing it. And you could, you would continue your transaction as if you, tr you know, if it was the bank or whatever it is. Um, so this is the main problem. The, 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 uh, lack of the security uh, aspects in the DNS um, lookup. Next, please. And this is a, one simple example of how this happens. Um, <clears throat> the, this, uh, this machine at the ISP, this name server, it, it went through a, 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 a long process to get that IP address for www.gov.tt. All right, so if another customer um, wants to go to www.gov.tt, it would have to go through that whole process again. So in order to avoid that from happening, what it uh, typically would do is, is cache that information or store it, all right, temporarily. So that if somebody else comes, it already has it locally without having to go this, through this whole process. So if an attacker can sort of fake some of these responses and that information gets cached at that ISP name server, then any of the ISP's customer later on coming to that uh, or using that name server to, to uh, www.gov.tt would go to this fake website and be affected. So this is called cache poisoning. And again, it's, it's in a nutshell. It's, it's, um, all the technical details uh, have been uh, left uh, um, possible. Uh, ne next, next slide. Uh, so this, this is just uh, some, uh, uh, something I pulled off the web um, where it, it's, it's an article that talks about uh, cash poisoning attacks to see email addresses. So it's not only uh, websites that are affected you can use cash poisoning, um, an attacker could use cash poisoning to actually view your emails. So in, in that case, what would happen is when you send an email to somebody, um, your machine has to connect to, or, or the, your mail server has to connect to uh, uh, another mail server. And again, it's IP address to IP address. So if you can fake that uh, uh, destination IP address, the attacker could then direct your email to its site, view your email, and then it would actually pass, pass it on to the correct destination. So you wouldn't even know that, that something is happening. Okay. Uh, next, please. So what is DNSSEC? Um, DNSSEC uses something called uh, public public key cryptography, 
and digital signatures. And it does two things. It authenticates responses. So when you get, when one of these uh, messages go back and forth, the response um, is authenticated, meaning that you know whoever sent that message is the person who you expected it from. All right, it's not from some third party. It also ensures data integrity. In other words, the information, that, that response that comes back to you um, is exactly what was sent. So if somebody tries to change some of that information, um, you will be able to detect it. What it does not do is provide confidentiality. In other words, the, the, the response itself is not encrypted. But remember the response, for instance, that mapping from www.gov.tt to that IP address. That is public information, so there's no need to really encrypt it. Everybody knows what it is, so uh, there's no encryption. Um, and it doesn't avoid uh, denialists of service attacks, which will still happen. Charlotte, you can see oh, it. Great, thanks. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what is public key encryption? And this is, again, this is a very loose definition of it um, for this particular scenario. So let, we're looking at a, 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 a reply, a response for a particular um, request. So the sender does what something called a hashing. It hashes the response message, the message that, that, that's supposed to come back to you. It hashes it. Hashes means it takes a, a, collapses it into a smaller um, form, and it encrypts that with a key. This encrypted uh, message is returned together with the response itself, the, the original response that you would have gotten just with DNS. Um, the receiver then uses something called a public key to decipher the encrypted message. And you can only decipher that encrypted message with the public key that corresponds to the private key that was used to encode that message, all right? So there's a, uh, this is what a, you know, a public private key pair. So if this um, public key, uh, if, if when you try to decipher with that public key, you were unsuccessful, you get garbage, then that means the private key that was used is not the one that you were expecting, which means that whoever sent it is not the person who was supposed to send it. So you can tell immediately that, that it, um, it, well, that's the authentication part. If it, if it is successful, then you can care, compare it with a hash version of the, the clear response, which is the, remember you get the, the, the original message itself. On the sender side, they hashed it and sent it along, uh, encrypted. So you, you can now uh, um, unencrypt the, the, the uh, hash version. You could hash the clear response you receive and compare them to see if anything changed. They should match up. If they don't match up, then the clear response was altered somehow. And so that, that's how you, you get, uh, at least for this one transaction, request, response, that that's how you, you ensure um, uh, authentication and integrity. Ne next, next please. So there is a, a, a still a problem in that the public key that matches the private key of the sender, um, you have to get it somehow. And um, that, may, that could potentially be a, a security problem as well. Uh, in the case of SSL, the way that's handled is using a certification of authority. You know, your, your browser would contact uh, CA to verify that the public key that you are using is correct, etc. But in this case, there's no such thing. Um, what, what the NSEC does in, in, instead is it uses, uses something called a, a chain of trust. And the way it's done is that, um, well, let's look at the example. 
So, so next, next please. So, remember it goes, the, the, the first request goes to this root server. And um, we, we, we can assume in a way that we know, we know um, what the public key is for that root server. And because we could hard code it into the software, etc. Or there are various ways to ensure that the resolver doing the uh, resolution has the correct public key for the root server. So let's assume we could trust the first response or we, we could trust the response from the root server. Because we could trust the response from the root server, then the root server can now tell us what the public key is for the next um, request we have to make. Because the root server is also telling us who to contact for the next re request, right? Uh, step four, going to write.nick.tt. So what the root server would do is pass along the uh, public key information. Uh, and again, this is loose, but the public key information um, that you would need for the next request in the process. And now with that new public key, you could ensure that the next request, which is the re request arrive.nick.tt, is also safe because we have the correct public key that we got from a trusted uh, party. So write.nick.tt could now give us the public key for the next um, um, re request to be made. And we can trust that because we, we, we now trust write.nick.tt. So we get the, the public key for the for, uh, dns5.gov.tt. And so we could finally make a trusted request to uh, dns5.gov.tt. And so we can um, be relatively sure that the response we get is, is, is uh, uh, correct. So that is what DNSSEC is in, in a very small nutshell. All right. Um, but as you see, there are several parties involved. You know, um, the root has to have the public key information for the for write.nic.tt, which is the the these underlying the the child zone, etc. And and that's the portion that you are not involved in, but it is a little bit complicated of, of getting these keys exchanged, etc. Um, okay, next next please. So that is the DNSSEC, and we, we, um, we need to have it for our security, uh, in addition to things like SSL and other uh, security measures. And this is a map showing, I believe this is probably from ISOC's website, maybe, <laughs> um, showing adoption of CCTLD um, DNSSEC as of uh, October last year. And uh, you won't be able to read it, but under operational, which is the last line, you have a list of the countries that are fully operational. And at the bottom there, you will see uh, TT. We are fully operational. Next, please. So why deploy, you know, uh, uh, for, for new GTLEs, new uh, generic top level domains, it is a requirement. Uh, for example, dot .bank, um, but for legacy ones, it is, it is not, but it should be because of, uh, as I said, the security concerns. It has vendor support, you know, all the, um, all the latest software supports DNSSEC, um, bind, etc. cetera. Um, it's a new differentiator for ISPs. If ISPs want to, uh, uh, differentiate themselves in terms of um, security. This is one way of doing it. It increases trust in e-commerce. Several people are, you know, getting off, uh, a little bit scared of e-commerce because of all the hacks that have been happening. Um, government services as well as, as, as banking. Um, and, and then new security products are a possibility. Next. Just to show you that .tt is signed, um, there is a, a, a plugin for, for Chrome. Uh, most of you are familiar with the, the, the um, 
the little key, well, in this case, a lock that you see when you connect a, a, a secure site, a, a site that uses SSL, right? When you use the HTTPS stuff, you see that lock, and you, if, 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 if it's not locked, you know it's not secure, right? So you're familiar with that. There's something similar for DNSSEC. Um, not as popular, but uh, the Chrome browser has a plugin for it. And um, so if you use that uh, on, on the top right, you see a, a little key instead. Uh, it's probably difficult to see, but there's a little key in green. Um, if you click on that, uh, you'll have a drop down of some a little bit additional information. And here it says www.nic.tt is secured by DNSSEC, et cetera, et cetera. So your site, when it, when it becomes, um, when, it, when, it, when you deploy DNSSEC for your zone, um, then, then you would have something similar. Uh, next, please. So what is your present status within uh, TT? In terms of the registries, yeah, TTNIC uh, has deployed it for about over two years now. We still need to get registrants involved and, and TTNIC is um, going to start, um, you know, trying to, to push this to, 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 to registrants and ask them to, to, to support the DNSSEC. Right now we have one subdomain sign and it's actually from um, uh, somebody at ICANN um, who's heavily involved in this, this stuff. Uh, ISPs, I am not sure what the plans are for DNSSEC resolvers at, at ISPs. Uh, remember that whole process starts off with the, the, your laptop or your client and goes to the ISP and then goes out, right? They all must have the, the support. So the laptop client must have the software supporting DNSSEC and the ISP must have the resolver, DNS um, resolver that supports uh, DNSSEC. And then the end users must also have uh, support. So we have some ways to go to have the complete uh, ecosystem uh, set up, but um, we are getting there. We, we will get there. Uh, next, please. So all the .tt is signed, you know, it's, it's just one initial step in this whole process. And uh, the TTNIC, um, is willing to work with uh, companies and various agencies um, to help get this done. Uh, thank you. Questions? Right, thank you. Have you all been reaching out to the uh, banking community? No, um, but we will, we eventually we will. Of course, there are other major issues with the banking community. We need to get um, things like credit card processing done, you know, have it local, etc. cetera. Um, they, they now, you know, of course, they, they now support SSL certificates, most of them. So, yeah, the next step would be the NSSEC. And um, so the TTNIC, through its uh, MAG, its multi-stakeholder advisory group, is going to start that process. Yeah, I was going to suggest it would be useful to do it for the association. So there's a bankers association of Trinidad and Tobago, and there are various sort of industry groups that I think would be a faster way of getting it to uh, places like banks, um, as opposed to you know going to individual companies. You may have to do both but I think certainly that sort of thing would be a, a fairly quick way of getting into them. Because the, particularly in the Bankers Association, for instance, is the managing directors of all of those companies that sit on those, on those associations. So you're getting to the real decision makers in, in the banks. So I think it would be a quick way to do it. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. And, and so maybe you could help us make some contacts here. Yeah. Not a problem. <laughs> Marlon? Uh, from on the client side, what 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 does the client have to do to get the, their machines, their laptop, their computers um, ready to work with the NSAC? Uh, 
I would have to check on that, Marlon. Uh, I, I, to be honest, I, uh, yes. Right. A shot, yeah. So it's still in a little bit of early stages. There are um, uh, most browsers support it now, and really the thing that's that's coming in support next is Dane. But DNSSEC is, is fairly widely supported by all the the big browsers. If you're up to date on your browser, you're probably set to go. He was on the client side. Yeah, uh, yeah the, the, the browsers the themselves. Yeah. yeah. So you, so most of them are already supported. Okay. Yeah. Now the email client I don't know about, um, but the, the browsers are mostly taken care of. Yeah, th thanks, Chris. I wasn't sure if they were all support if they all supported it, so I didn't want to make a claim that it wasn't true. Yeah. Any any other questions? Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. One quick question then. Um, going back to that chain of trust regarding the DNSSEC, what happens if the, what exactly happens if the private key is compromised, it's leaked to the internet or for whatever reason, how is then does that key, I guess, revoked and, and so that all the, uh, and a new one is sent? What exactly, I mean, is it a, it sounds a complicated process, I don't know. Yeah, if the private key is compromised, yeah, then, then you know, basically everything is, is, is lost, right? The whole system breaks down. So you need to um, continuously keep changing the keys. Um, and if you find out that, that it is uh, compromised, then you have to, of course, yeah, switch it off and, and switch a new key. Um, it, it, again, it is a complicated process, and I have you know, left off a lot of the, uh, in intricacies, but yes. Great. If there's no other questions on, on DNSSEC, we'll jump ahead now. Um, now, um, my colleague at the Internet Society, Sharon Masepa, is going to be uh, moderating a panel on uh, writing around cat catastrophe, on s the resiliency of the Internet, basically. So I'd like to ask uh, Reynold Gruyere, uh, Steve Spence, Bevel Wooding, and uh, Sharon to come up. And I'll hand it over to Sharon. Thank you. So good afternoon to all. As Chris said, my name is Shernan Osepa. I'm the manager of regional affairs, Latin American Caribbean at Internet Society. And I'll be moderating Hello. this session, which is entitled Routing Around Catastrophe. And we have some very knowledgeable panelists. So I'd like to invite all of them to come forward. Uh, Shannon, can you hear me? Okay. So first we'd like to thank um, Patrick for his presentation. We know um, most of us are using the internet and there are some challenges. I mean, um, especially here in the Caribbean, he didn't, he didn't mention it, but the Caribbean is being seen as a playing ground by hackers. I know that from my previous um, and also this particular job, that a, a lot is being done um, in the Caribbean, especially hackers from Europe and from some other countries, given that they know that our networks are wide open. They're just using us to, for their 
to, to, to develop their skills. And um, one of the technologies that can be used to try stopping these kind of things. So um, Patrick, very, thank you very much for your, your presentation. In addition to that, the internet itself, we know that is a very complicated um, routing system in which traffic is being routed among all the, uh, these networks. As you may know, the internet consists of a lot of uh, networks and all of them are so there should be a way to keep all this traffic secure. So basically, this is what we're going to deal with in this, in this, um, this session. Reinhold is online as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have, as I did mention before, some very knowledgeable presenters. We have Mr. Steve Spence from Architects. We have Reynold Guerrier from Jesus in Haiti. We have Bevel Wooding, Packet Clearing House, and he has a lot of other heads as well. But he will be speaking today on behalf of um, Packet Clearing House. And we have also Marlon Ragunan from the University of the West Indies here in Trinidad and Tobago. So I would like to start with um, Mr. Steve Spence, and basically he's going to talk a bit on technical implementation with respect to secure BGP, and why do we need BGP? So that is basically what he's going to elaborate on. So Steve, the floor is yours. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Um, I want to um, bring a slide, okay? <laughs> Very short. Um, BGP is um, similar to um, uh, DNSSEC in terms of the, the fundamental infrastructure or technology that drives the internet. And it, it, it's one of those infrastructure that developed in a more naive time in which um, all the roads, roads were, everybody trusted each other and, and the infrastructure that drives the internet um, essentially trust everybody to pay fairly. Now, um, since the internet has evolved into a, a commercial entity, there are not so nice people around. Not everybody can be trusted anymore. And essentially, BGP essentially is one of the core infrastructure that allow you to actually have the internet. Without BGP, there'd be no internet. Okay, it's just fundamental. It's, however, is a technology that users are the, the end user is not really aware of. And it's also in the domain of the ISP are very large multi-home networks. So BGP essentially allow routers to actually know where to find or send subscriber data. That's basically it. Now, the dangers of, of that is that each router is, is required to actually have a table or a list of all the routes all over the internet. And so there are major routers that has an address book that says, hey, I know where to find um, um, Google. I know where to find Microsoft. I know where to find Cisco. Okay? However, this information is exchanged based on good, good um, um, of, and trust. And so, therefore, what has happened recently is that um, hackers, people who might not be less than desirable, or people just playing around, have essentially have the ability to poison or redirect or corrupt these tables. And so it has become critical for us to actually protect and put in a better infrastructure for ensuring that the core tables that describe where to find things in the internet actually get protected. And that's where secure BGP is actually being developed and leveraged. Um, basically, it has three components. It requires a public key infrastructure, just like DNSSEC. It, it requires DNS um, servers to, um, to actually um, when, we, when we register for IP addresses, uh, our register for AS names, that we actually get them um, signed and certified. And essentially, we essentially we say anybody who actually buys or use a bunch of IP address will essentially have a digital certificate saying that I really have the right to own this thing. Number two, we need routers that has this information stored somewhere or cached in it on the, on the ISP network. 
And so therefore, um, IP set essentially says that every, every address is certified, well known, and understood to be from a particular provider. And essentially, when we exchange, when routers exchange information, they first have to verify that these router updates or this router information is actually from the owners of these addresses. And so therefore, attacks that we direct our cipher off or our wiretap information will no longer be as easy as it is right now. And so IPsec essentially offers ISPs, um, large network, the ability to protect customers. For example, when you want to say you're going to Amazon, you can guarantee that you're going to Amazon. IPs, IP DNSSEC certified the DNS infrastructure. The, the, um, the um, secure BGP will certify the actual IP address is who that IP address is. Okay, so therefore, DNSSEC will guarantee that you're actually going to Amazon.com. Now that IP address that is translated to an IP address, that IP address has to also be certified that it's actually the right, um, the, the right person. Or somebody's not listening into your communications without you knowing that it's actually there. Or if you have a nice website that everybody's streaming website that everybody's coming to, and somebody can't do a denial of service attack that essentially cipher off all your um, subscribers' traffic. So some of the um, weaknesses of a current system is that ISP, um, ISPs can receive a denial, denial of service, a denial of service uh, attack that cannot be actually easily overcome. They, they, we can certify that the website you're going to is the actual website you want to go to, okay? And essentially, we can certify that exchanges of information between ISPs is verified, certified, and true. Okay, that's in a nutshell, the secure BGP and why we need it, okay? Good. Thank you very much, Steve. Are there questions for Steve? No? So there will be um, the opportunity to ask questions at the end as well. So um, I would like to move on with uh, Mr. Marlon. So he's from the University of the West Indies here in Trinidad and Tobago. And he's here going to talk a bit on customer perspective with respect to routing. Marlon, please. Can I move this? I think we can use that. No, no, I am. Let's see what I'm. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, from the sessions this week, I think we pretty much scared the hell out of everyone. Um, considering cybersecurity and how ready, we, how ready we are for all of this. So could I ask before you fall asleep on me that we take a deep breath and breathe out so that we all refresh about this. Um, some of what I will say um, touches on, on what you've heard already for the, for the week, um, from, but from the customer perspective. So we looked at some of the challenges that we had in trying to, to implement security and redundancy. And uh, I just have a few major points that I want to throw out, out at you. One of the first challenge we had was in planning. And the idea about planning is what do we want to achieve? And everyone wants business resilience. Should something happen to the business? Should something happen to the services? Uh, these services runs on the internet, it runs on DNS. Um, how do we address that? And there are a couple of ideas to achieve that resilience. Uh, we need to do proper planning for connectivity, for what our IP schemes are gonna be, how we're gonna scale, and um, I have a note about rules slash adherence to that. And I said adherence are not enforcements because most of the internet is actually based on consensus, open government. Um, the other challenge we have is equipment. Um, we had a case where in our recent network upgrade, 
um, which is by a major vendor, we had equipment where the ether channels weren't coming up. And what that means is that on the two core switches where we have redundant links, one of the links failed to come up. So we changed the blade. And then we did it again, and same problem. So we changed the blade a third time. On our second data center, we noticed it. Same problem. So at the end of the third time, we say, okay, what's going on here? It's only after the manufacturer got involved after the third blade change when we tell them this shouldn't be happening. They did some investigation, actually took them quite a while, realized there is a problem with the manufacturing design of this 10 g blade, right? And we have another issue too. Now this is an establishing, this is equipment that has been sold to the world for years. <coughs> Why does you as the people to discover it for the entire world? I don't know. But that's how it runs. Uh, we have another issue in the management platform where we discovered that that management platform, again being sold to the entire world for years, does not discover certain devices on the network. So you take the management platform out and you replace it by a machine. And if the problem was the platform, then you should be able to ping the device that it don't find it. And guess what? It's still not finding it, which points to a major underlying issue with the entire network saying, okay, why are these devices not being found? So these kinds of issues with equipment that even though it is established for many years in the world, may show up in the deployments. And that's something you don't know before. And that's something which now we have to plan for. And the third challenge we had is with ISPs. And we have a couple of them, which is for a very long time, all ISPs couldn't provide IPv6 transit. So even though we have a block of IPv6 addresses from LACNIC for at least a couple of years, we could do nothing with them except use them internally. Um, we now start a discussion for BGP routing so that we could use redundant links to the internet. And there's another major challenge we had where our IF, ISPs don't react fast enough to the faults that we identify. The first thing they tell you is your fault. And then we have to work with them and show here what? Yeah, we, we're not running an ISP, but we know what we're talking about. And this is the proof that is your problem. So that's it. Third challenge we have um, dealing with ISPs. So which leads us leads me to my last section, which is how our approach, our next steps, and our action items. Well, for DNS, we run our, our own DNS servers. So we actually have a DNS server that sits on, the, on our DMZ on the outside, and everything internally looks up via that. So we will be working with Dr. Hussain to implement DNSSEC on that. And I guess we will be working with Steve to do BGP security. Um, in terms of redundancy, we mirror our DNS servers across the other campuses. We have started to build relationships and we actually work at the technical level with a lot of the ISPs because you know, account managers are there to sort you out when you want to buy a service. When it breaks, they can't help you. You have to go to the technical level. And we are also exploring a lot of options to have redundant links across our, our, our sites on island. And we have these options for trying to get dark fiber as the ideal thing to link those sites. 
We have also, as I mentioned, trying, we're going to start this year to, to implement BGP routing with one of our major um, ISP providers. Uh, we have done it already with one of our other links, and that's a link that actually terminates in the North of the Americas. So we actually have our own routers up there, and we've done it with that. And we actually use, and this is touching on some of the prior presentations this week, um, use the TT Rent or the Caribnet network as a backup network for internet and transit within the country. And I guess my last point is that we have started, in addition, discussion with the ISPs to deploy hot uh, or warm or even cold standby equipment where they actually bring in redundant links onto the campus. And should any service goes down, it will either fail over automatically or it will be an easier fix to get the service turned back on. Um, because we've had an issue, I think it was two years ago, where during carnival time, which comes up in another two weeks, we had a nice truck that passed and break down a fiber for the spin that affected our service in St. Augusta. That's about it in a nutshell. Thanks very much, Marlon. Provided there are some pressing questions, I would like to proceed with um, Reynolds, and then after that, we will be having uh, some discussions. So our next presenter is Reynold Guerrier. He is from Haiti, a company called GISIS, and he's the CEO of that um, organization. So um, our friend um, Reynold, you ready? We, we don't have voice. J just, just a moment. Let, let's let me ever. Just a moment, let me just ar arrange the voice. We don't have the voice. Come in, we're locked. Yes, okay. okay. Reynolds, are you ready? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can okay, hear you. Uh, okay, thank you, okay. go ahead. Sorry for not being here with you, uh, 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 um, uh, because uh, I couldn't make the uh, the trip to Trinidad and Tobago, but I'm very delighted uh, to be with you uh, on this panel. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, uh, Isaac for this uh, invitation. Uh, my my presentation will be about uh, 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 the physical infrastructure. Uh, uh, in, in uh, catastrophic time, because um, in Haiti, uh, unfortunately, we have been able to um, uh, make some improvement in the in the internet, uh, the hardware. Uh, when I what I mean, what I mean by uh, the hardware, it's uh, when uh, something happened. Uh, in 2008, uh, there was uh, a big hurricane that struck uh, in Dominican Republic. And uh, at this time, most of uh, the local providers have uh, had their um, uh, upstream providers uh, from the Dominican Republic. And uh, uh, some tower uh, collapsed, and then we have been, uh, we have been out of uh, the internet for the shortest, uh, for the shortest uh, uh, time. For one of the ISP, it was uh, uh, 36 hours, and for the longest, it was seven days. And uh, after this, uh, uh, all the local ISPs uh, saw the, uh, the, the necessity to get connect locally. So uh, that's why we started our first ISP in 2009. And uh, in 2010, in January 2010, the country has been struck by um, uh, a huge earthquake that uh, um, make uh, a lot of... Uh, 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 damage to um, internet infrastructure, and uh, at uh, at that time, only the the the, the building 
who host, uh, uh, that host the data exchange point resist and they saw the necessity to have interconnection and uh, they continue to, to, to um, uh, uh, communicate between themselves. So um, uh, to make all this happen, you need to want BGP, as the first uh, presenter said, uh, no, no BGP, no internet, uh, um, uh, unfortunately. But uh, uh, as you said in your uh, introduction, uh, uh, Shannon, uh, the Caribbean is like uh, 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 most of the hackers all around the world has used a uh, uh, Caribbean uh, network to, to, to um, uh, get improvement in what they are doing. And uh, I know that because in the past I worked for uh, uh, NISP and uh, we experienced a lot of attacks from, uh, on uh, our servers. And also uh, many times we had that uh, um, our IP addresses being blackmailed, be, uh, uh, be blacklisted because uh, um, uh, we, are, we, we, we were uh, a source of uh, spamming. Uh, so, if local ISPs understand the need to have a uh, 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 very uh, redundant, very strong, uh, reliable infrastructures, but uh, it's not an issue yet for them to um, uh, run uh, uh, secure BGP and uh, to uh, uh, or DNSSEC. Some are, some of them are doing it. But uh, some of, some others are um, uh, uh, leave that to uh, uh, the customer himself, and uh, in this case, what we are doing right now, because as a member of uh, uh, um, the Asian Association for ICCs, and also as the technical manager of the um, Internet Exchange Point, we are uh, doing a lot of uh, forums and uh, also seminars to build awareness about the um, necessity to have a network really resilient, but also very uh, secure. Um, uh, because uh, when a network is not the secure, it's not only uh, an end user problem, but it all, it's, uh, also the, the, uh, the, the trust we can put to uh, uh, your provider. So uh, right now we are uh, doing a lot of, uh, uh, um, uh, as I said, a lot of, we are building a lot of awareness, uh, making a lot of uh, um, uh, seminar with uh, the local ISPs because they are participating in the IXP and then it's the only way we can uh, uh, make them understand the importance of uh, uh, to run a very secure network and particularly, we, we are making a seminar on DNSSEC and also um, uh, 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 BGP, secu auto securing their, 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 their BGPs. So um, uh, this is um, what uh, I had to share with you. So I'm waiting if there are uh, questions, I will be uh, glad to, to, to answer them. OK, thank you very much, uh, Reynold. Are there questions? Can, can you stay a bit or do you need to no, leave? No, no, I can, I can, I can. Okay, because we like to ask um, panelists some questions later on and if you can stay with us a bit, that would... No problem. Okay, um, our next presenter is Mr. Bevel Wooding and he's, he will be talking a bit on the policy aspects of um, security. Bevel. Thanks, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so we've looked so far at some of the, the security technologies. We've uh, heard examples from both the, the University of the West Indies, an institution, and uh, coming out of the, the Haiti experience. And I want to look um, at the issue of routing around catastrophe from um, another level. As you know, as internet strategists for packet clearing house, I'm also um, very much involved with CARIBNOG, the Caribbean Network Operators Group, and we have been able to to, um, to scan the, the networks and, and to look into how uh, countries, governments, organizations have been approaching the issue of, of network security. Um, and we found that the, the two of the, the biggest um, 
security vulnerabilities are, and I'm going to throw some more acronyms since we heard BGP, DNSSEC, I'm going to add two more, uh, LPP vulnerability, which I'm sure any of you have heard of, the LPP vulnerability, and the more virulent form of that, which is the NPP vulnerability. And I see some, some quizzical looks. Surely everyone knows LPP is limited public policy. And NPP, which we found across the region, is no public policy concerning security. You all, you all are familiar with these, these security vulnerabilities, right? Yeah? yeah. It's a big issue here in the region. And, um, and one of the reasons why it's such a big deal is, is at the policy level, um, people simply don't know that there is a problem or that the, the networks are there to be protected. There's an understanding that telecommunications is important, the technology is playing a bigger role um, in the economy and so on, uh, but the, the, the flow back into how decisions are taken around uh, investing in security and security systems uh, is still a work in progress. And so I want to look at it from that standpoint. If we, if we have to discuss critical internet infrastructure and uh, what some of these protocols and trends and so on mean, uh, then first, of course, there has to be a, a universal understanding of critical, the criticality of internet infrastructure uh, before you can start um, putting resources either at the, the, the public sector level, but also at the private sector level. Um, and I want to give this example that um, I know Steve Spence may remember when we, we at Carib Nog uh, 6 asked a question. This is a room filled with 100 uh, network administrators and security practitioners from across the region. So a fairly sizable audience um, and a very senior audience in terms of technical, um, technical skill and responsibility asked, how many of you have disaster plans for your organizations? And three hands went up. One, two, three. Two of those hands belong to Monstratons, people from Monstrat. And they had just come out of a volcanic eruption. And so they, after the fact, um, saw the need to, to start implementing at a national level, um, at a policy level, uh, systems to deal with business continuity, disaster preparedness, and so on. And that's why I give these, these two as the biggest vulnerabilities right now. Um, uh, one of the, the, the things about securing networks is you have to know how to secure them. Uh, one of the things about knowing how to secure them is you have to have some sense of urgency concerning why they need to be secured. And the biggest deflator of such an urgency is ignorance. If I don't know that this thing really is a big deal, then my budgets go elsewhere and my resources go elsewhere. And so one of the, the in, in looking at the issue of routing around catastrophe and, and, and thinking about it from a, a public policy standpoint, the definition of critical internet infrastructure has to be, um, has to be put on the table. And this is something that uh, CTU is doing, uh, certainly at the, the government level, and the Caribnog is doing at the technical community level, uh, looking at the issue of information assets that are essential to supporting government business, you know, a definition that, that covers the different stakeholders, uh, components that deal with critical public infrastructure, lights or electricity, um, water supply, transportation, grids, and so on, uh, any of the, the, the information systems uh, essential to the national economy. And when considered from that standpoint, it allows for a grid of uh, consideration to be placed over uh, exactly what's happening with the networks. And so I want to list just for the discussion today, uh, six points uh, that we can look at as protection requirements or protection imperatives. One is there has to be clear policy objectives. Uh, that's a start, a ground zero for um, looking at the issue of public policies. There has to be uh, a clear sense of what are we trying to accomplish when we say we want more secure national or more secure corporate networks. The objectives have to be clear and defined. Uh, there has to be defined responsibility. Who, which institution, which agency, which department in the organization will be responsible for it. Now, for some of you in this room, this may seem an obvious list, but trust me, it's not so obvious. And uh, part of what we want to do with this panel discussion and even in this forum is just to have these things documented so that it can be shared across organizations. Those who know can share it with those who don't know. The third protection requirement would be structured dialogue. And when I say structured dialogue, I'm referring to the, um, the, the, the setting up or the establishment of groups, either formal or informal, that discuss these issues in a structured way. 
not just conference-based or event-based, but just as you would have, and many of you would be familiar with, with groups like the National Security Council, right? What do they do? They sit and they meet and they look at reports and they discuss strategies for national security as it relates to crime and crime prevention, uh, protection of borders. In the same way, a structured discussion around the critical internet infrastructure assets has to happen. Uh, some people looking at the actual technical assets, the hardware. Some people looking at the network protocols and some of the emerging trends. Others looking at the vulnerabilities and the risks and the exposure, both at the national level, but also um, national level generally, but national level in terms of economy and society. And splitting those conversations into teams that can then bring it together in one room as one coherent discussion, structured dialogue. The fourth is the policy and legal frameworks, um, which of course... Uh, will always be an issue in terms of the speed with which the legislation can catch up or keep pace with the evolving technology landscape and the evolving threat landscape. Uh, the fifth point would be uh, a process for the review of infrastructure, and that is an ongoing process. You know, many of you may, may have heard that um, infrastructure like the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge, there is a constant repair cycle. You go from one end to the other, repeat and, and so whether it's paint uh, whether it's rust repair whether it is bolt replacement it never ends same thing has to apply uh, in terms of how we look at the issue of the critical internet infrastructure uh, from a review standpoint a cycle that never ends threat solution review new threat new solution review uh, as part of the, the, the policy concerning an approach to, to securing and protecting against harm and then the sixth point, uh, security risk assessment. Again, for some of you, this may seem like the obviously, but at a national level, and even at some of the, the larger corporation level, and well, let's not even talk about the small business level, uh, understanding the risks is a process. And putting before decision makers a clear roadmap of here are the challenges, these are the, 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 the exposure points and here are a list of, of possible strategies to mitigate against those exposure points it is not common practice. Uh, we have now, we're now into what, the, the fifth or sixth year of Caribnog, we're into the, the fourth or fifth year of the Caribbean ICT road show, and I'm telling you, um, the, the things that uh, more mature organizations do as a matter of routine and course uh, that now need to apply because of the pervasiveness of, of information systems, uh, that will include things like an assessment of what you have and what you're doing with it doesn't apply across the board. And the risk, the, the, the danger here for all of us, whether we're inside of large institutions or small organizations, is that if someone is not looking at a part of the network infrastructure that you have to trust or depend upon, you are also at risk. And this is where the, the whole cyber approach, well, at least things are safe in my garden or in, in my organization or in my department, um, really gets blown out of the water because the vulnerability can come from somewhere external and still impact your network and still cost dollars and still bring down time. So the security risk assessment is another part. So quickly, uh, clear policy objectives, define responsibility, structured dialogue, policy and legal frameworks, review and security enhancements and a security risk assessment process. And then to manage the risk, I'll just list uh, five points and we'll leave it at that for the QA. Uh, the issue of a security incident response mechanism. Um, many of you would have heard of certs and, and C-certs and the like. Um, that can happen at a, an institutional level, but it can also um, be set in place at the national level. Uh, I'm, and I, I'm sure we can hear whether UE has a, a security incident response framework in place, or whether the government has one, or whether um, any of the banks or insurance companies, or even our ISPs who... Anyway, for those who, who, um, who track it, when they get hacked, you'll be surprised at some of the scrambling that takes place to repair the breach. Um, and so security incident response is a big part of managing risk and one of the top recommendations. Secondly, partnerships, public-private, private-private, public-public, intergovernmental, interagency partnerships to ensure that the right people are having the right conversations. Uh, some of these threats are cross-border threats. Right? And sometimes tracing the source of an attack goes not just outside of the country, but outside of the region. And so the right kinds of, of, of relationships have to be forged and the right kinds of relationships have to be um, cultivated. 
research and education, research, sorry, one point, focus, projects focus on the improvement of security and the, the consequences of not improving security. And then education, dealing with both the technical capacity and as we heard throughout the day, dealing with, dealing with the leadership sensitization issue. And then last point, participation, participation, participation. Uh, in both national uh, fora, regional fora, and international fora, dealing with technical community issues and security issues. I hope this has given a, just like a framework for, for consideration from the policy standpoint. The threat is real, but the, the responses can be equally robust to defend against it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Bevo. Before I open the floor for questions and comments, I would like to ask a few questions to the panelists. Let me start first with um, Bevel Wooding. I know that you have been quite, Bevel, <laughs> I know that you have been quite um, active with respect to promotion and deployment of IXPs in, in the Caribbean. So, um, an IXP is just not like an internet exchange point, for those of you who are not familiar with that acronym. I see that Bevel did introduce a few more today as well. So um, we know that an IXP is not just a loose thing over there. I mean, basically, it's part of the internet. Whenever you build an IXP, basically you are building a part of the infrastructure of the internet. So um, in that regard, how did you manage to convince, especially um, those involved with respect to deployment of IXP, what should be done with respect to security um, challenges that we are facing or have been facing? Interesting. Okay. Yeah, good question. The, the IXPs are considered, or the internet exchange points are considered part of the critical internet infrastructure. And I, I think we heard the example from Haiti that the role that the IXP played uh, following the earthquake when there was a, a, a near complete collapse of the telecommunications infrastructure. And the IXP, and, and Renal can jump in and, and support me here, the IXP played a critical role in enabling internal connectivity when the external uh, connections were, were disrupted. Uh, that's a serious role for a piece of infrastructure to play. And examples like that allowed us to, in the first instance, uh, make the case for national or, or, or local IXPs. Uh, and even then, people weren't convinced because, of course, well, uh, an earthquake is not likely to happen in my fill-in-the-blank country name. Um, but we still had to, to make this, this uh, strong point that when you have control over fundamental or foundational aspects of critical internet infrastructure, you have control over your response in times of crisis. And um, what, has, what has happened and, and needs to happen more is following the launch of several of the, the exchange points, particularly in the Eastern Caribbean, uh, we recognize that the, the focus uh, of the internet service providers whose, whose primary concern was peering to, to offload uh, domestic traffic um, really turned away from the IXP itself. And that left a kind of hole in the consideration of who's going to look at the role the IXPs play in securing local networks. And so right now, part of the, the, the Caribnog agenda, and I hope also part of the ISOC agenda, uh, is a second round of sensitization, which essentially says, hey, now that you have an IXP, why not secure it? And uh, uh, that's a, a fundamental question that is being put out to the, um, the, the current operators of the exchange points. One of the characteristics of, of some of the smaller Caribbean exchange points is that they, they don't have a dedicated um, peering coordinator or somebody whose primary responsibility is to just look after the growth and stability and resilience of the exchange point. And so the message has to get not to the IX, but to the ISPs, the internet service providers and their teams. Um, and if you know anything about some of the, the developments taking place in the, in the current ISP landscape, things are pretty tumultuous right now. And so getting that focus, not now on, on integrating networks and defending against competitive threats, but on securing the, the core assets inside of the network, uh, it's, it's, it's been a struggle, but it's an important struggle that we, we continue to press on. Right. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, one thing I would like to, to, to add like at this point. To... Can you hear me? Right now? You're on? Yes, go yeah. ahead, please. Yeah, one thing I would like to add uh, uh, to what uh, uh, Bivol just said, it's right now we are dealing with uh, a very challenging issue about security in, uh, um, at the IXP level because um, some ISPs, particularly the big guys, the, the, uh, the, the cell phone companies who, um, uh, who are also internet providers, they don't want to be interconnected to the ISPs to avoid uh, 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 only ISPs terminating uh, VOIP calls to their network. And uh, that where, that, that, that where we uh, came in um, with, uh, uh, <clears throat> with the necessity to have them securing their network so they can control what kind of traffic is uh, going through their network. And uh, uh, that uh, it's not to fear them, but uh, to more to build awareness to say, okay, if you don't want people to terminate VOIP call because um, they are, it's a more international uh, call uh, uh, terminating to their network, uh, they said, okay, that's why we don't want to connect to the IXP. They say, oh, uh, no, what you, you have to do is to control uh, to securing BGP and uh, 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 defining what kind of traffic you would accept from your network. And uh, it was a very strong argument uh, uh, to, to, to convince them to run uh, a security, uh, particularly securing their BGP traffic between uh, uh, other local ISPs. Okay, um, thank you, just one second. Thank you, um, Reynolds. I think um, you mentioned, for example, the, I think it was the hurricane, right, in 2008, because basically that's something that we'll never forget because I was also stranded in Haiti. Sure. So I will never forget yeah. it. And I think um, based on what, what you said, it's not only to, um, okay, uh, we, we are focusing on capacity building on different level levels. I'm not sure maybe if this is um, something that we, um, let me see how to, to, to say this. I mean, we know that a, that a hurricane doesn't happen every day, you know, but still yeah. we do have people with enough experience who went through all these natural disasters and that are able and willing to, assisting the global community. So in that regard, I think you and also uh, Max Larson and some others on, on it there in Haiti yeah, are key uh, resources we, that we should be using. Yeah. I, I can assure you, Ken Cardenas, actually we are, um, uh, 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 we are working with Akamai to put, uh, to install their, their uh, content uh, uh, servers uh, at the IXP after we already install uh, Google Cache. So we are uh, trying to build a more and more reliable uh, internet and also uh, to um, uh, put less stress on the international uh, capacity. So, um, uh, and I'm not the only one dealing with that. As you just said, there is also Max uh, Larson Henry uh, and uh, my colleague uh, Regis Chauvet who are um, uh, working um, uh, uh, all the all night to, to, to make all this happen. Yes, I would like to give, thank you. I would like to give Bevel opportunity to say some more comments. Yeah, just, just quickly, Shunan, the, the issues that Reynolds has raised, again, point to policy. And that's one of the, the other um, vulnerabilities I neglected to mention, which was the ICDP, which is ill-conceived commercial policy. Um, and that's where you have uh, private sector companies uh, who have private sector motives, which are fine. Um, that then actually stand in variance or stand in variance to um, basic network or engineering um, efficiencies. Mm -hmm. And it's a reality. It's a reality where, where um, someone makes a business decision that then compromises the network security um, beyond their business. Um, but they may not be conscious of the fact that this desire to secure profits or to secure markets is actually threatening the stability of the markets themselves. And that, that again is a, a case for education, sensitization, and so on. Okay, thank you. Then I have a question for Marlon from Univers University of the West Indies. As an academic institution, um, 
what does you we do basically to i mean in addition to giving courses and things like that what does you we do to promoting secure bgp and all this kind of um, stuff that we that we spoke about a while ago do you do you have some um, insights exactly what 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 are being do um, um doing um done at um, UE? Um, well, I think this question would probably best be addressed to Dr. Sain. <laughs> so, so, sorry, what was your question? Basically, what is what is being done at UWE, given that you guys are an academic institution, to um, to to ensure that we continue to have secure BGP and um, internet routing and all these kind of things that we have been talking about. Okay, yeah, I, I can only uh, talk on the academic side of things. Um, and uh, what I've been trying to do, at least in our graduate program, is to um, include more practical um, education. So many of our courses now include um, hands-on, uh, whether it's um, simulations or development on, in the cloud, um, and uh, security is, is a major, um, major aspect, you know, for instance, right now we have a, um, one of my courses, we, we are doing uh, e-commerce and a course involves um, uh, groups developing um, uh, e-commerce uh, e portals and, and they each are going to attack each other's portal to try to break it. And, and so we try to, to get them more excited about um, not breaking things, but finding out things that can get broken into um so yeah from an academic point of view yeah that, that's that's what we're trying to attempt to do okay thank um, you if I, if I may add just, just a couple things um yeah that's a very good question and um let me let me give you an analogy and think about yourself as a home owner right and the question is um what can you do without and for how long? And they have three choices. You have electricity, you have water, and you have the internet connection. So how long can you live without, with your internet at your home being off, with the electricity to your home being off, or with the water supply to your home being off? Right? It comes down to an idea of priority. Right? And trying to sell that to campus management has been a long running challenge to us, uh, primarily because uh, we haven't yet succeeded in getting them to realize that the entire organization runs on IT. Without that, nothing works. And we need to accomplish that before they can get, begin to appreciate when we ask for something, we need it. To support the business. Okay, thank you, Marlon. I have a question then before I open the floor to Steve. Steve, you have been focusing on the customer perspective, so I guess you are trying always to keep your customers satisfied. So, what what, what have you been doing um, in that regard, especially to get, to to um, to keep your um, not not only to keep your clients, but also to maintain them quite satisfied with secure internet systems. That's an okay. Um, one of the issues that you run into is that um, um, we're, we're, we're our business is essentially consultancy. We, we advise our customers how to secure their their actual infrastructure, and and a little bit of the same problem is that. It, they don't always see that as a priority. And so you walk in and see all sorts of atrociousness behavior. And, they, and they, they sort of, all sorts of, of, of like, um, it's like having a, a store in which nobody really do or actually remove. Like you have a mall, and then at the end of the night, you just simply open the door and, and leave. That's essentially how most people actually operate their network, uh, or integrate themselves into the ISP network. And and one of the things we had to do is to have training, sensitive training, to, to emphasize how important it is to, to be 
no one security um, um, security aware, as well as seeing that your business, this, this is actually your business. No longer is your business paper anymore. There are people walking around with data that if they lose that data, their business will actually go to business. And we have customers where that come to. And, and I sit down and say, okay, we have gone to all this trouble. We have recovered your network. We saved your, 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 your data. How much is this worth to you? You saw that your business almost went under because you did not put the proper security in place. And only then they begin to actually see okay. that um, security and protect, putting the proper mechanism and paying for that mechanism is actually critical to how their business actually run. And so, so for, the, for the most part, people are just not seeing, I guess because in some ways this the notion of secure, internet security is a bit abstract. It's not like a door, it's not like thieves busting down your door. Um, it, the only time you feel, you feel have a problem is if your credit card gets used or your internet, your um, bank account gets sabotaged, it's the only time they actually feel violated. But otherwise from that, no, they, they don't really think about it in a practical way. And our job in most cases is to make them aware of the issues and emphasize that you do need to invest capital, invest putting infrastructure to protect and, and, um, and support your business. And it's a business decision, not just a technical one. Okay, thank you, Steve. So I would like to open up the floor. Are there questions? Uh, I want to direct this, this question. Please, please, yeah, identify, please identify yourself so that the audience can know who is that. Please. Julia McIntyre, the CTU. Uh, I would like to direct this question to Bevel as it relates to policy. Um, heard a lot today about the, the challenges that institutions have, ISPs have in terms of uh, not implementing security measures, DNSSEC, BGP routing, secure BGP, etc. And the, the primary reason um, is because it's not being enforced. There is no, there is no regulation policy, um, overarching policy that would enforce or that will really you know, sort of enforce the, the implementation. So my question is, in some cases, you hear a lot of regulators speak about um, when they're framing their policy, the only issue of they, it must be technology neutral. In other words, they tend not to specify or to be too, to be too specific. Um, of course, because you have different service providers, uh, network operators who have specific te uh, technology, and they don't want to speak to any specific technology. They want their policies to be more or less um, unbiased or appear to be unbiased. Um, in a general sense. Now, when we're talking about DNSSEC and secure BGP routing, we're talking about a specific technology. My question is, um, does the regulation or the regulators need to have move away from the soft touch approach and to be a little more granular, um, a little more direct in terms of um, and specific because of the evolving technologies? So in terms of framing your regulations, do you need to be more specific and speak to the real issues as opposed to maintaining that light touch approach and being very, very open-ended. And I don't know if that is an issue or what would you suggest in a case like that? All right, uh, to, to me the issue junior starts uh, before that, which is the issue of, um, of just awareness, education. Uh, and at, uh, before regulators could decide whether to light touch or heavy touch, they have to know what they're touching. And, um, and that's why they, 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 the definition of the space what is critical internet infrastructure? What are the implications for national networks, national economies, and so on, has to first be uh, accepted and, and, and agreed upon. Um, actually, I think this is a, a, a role that the, the resurgent uh, CTU can play in terms of bringing a, a, a regional definition to the issue one of internet infrastructure, or critical internet infrastructure, but two to the issue of the, the framework for consideration for any country or institution considering securing critical as, um, network assets. You see, that starts the conversation going. That starts the, 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 the dialogue around uh, what should we do in whatever particular case or context. The university considering this same list that I gave would be very different from the government considering the same list. Uh, in uh, collaboration, for example, looks very different between departments than it does between countries or even between ministries. And so uh, agreement on the, the, the nature of the, the problem space, the implications or ramifications for inaction or insufficient action, and the benefits of a, a structured approach to um, oversight and stewardship, I think will be 
the start point before you can even get into uh, whether or not it should be lightly or heavily touched. Are there other questions? Maybe Secretary General, you would like to comment a bit on whether or not the CTU would like to play such a role? A role? Yes, absolutely. As the panel discussion was going on, my brain was already working in terms of uh, how do we now pull all of these things together? Because the first thing that came to me is it's always about public awareness and education. Uh, the policymakers, it's not on their radar because nobody has really taken the time to bring it to their attention. The pace of the, the technological innovation is phenomenal and the wheels of government move very slowly. So there must be an initiative to raise this to the level of government and I'm thinking, okay, that is something I'm going to do. But there's nothing better than demonstrating because you could talk from now till Ash Wednesday, which wasn't so far away <laughs> as this saying goes, about, um, ab about the need to secure networks. But if you could demonstrate, and this is something actually that the CTU was, was trying to do some uh, a, a year ago, but I'm thinking perhaps you could, could work more closely with Caribnog in actually doing, pointing, doing the assessments of our member governments, of the governments, pointing to the vulnerabilities and doing and helping them and demonstrating to them that their networks they, are, are vulnerable. And I think if we could get the government uh, acting in a particular way, it's going to encourage others to, to be um, more, more uh, recognize the, the, the deficiencies that, that exist. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, still thinking this through, but I, I certainly feel the public awareness is absolutely necessary. We could uh, perhaps have a, a, a ministerial forum dedicated to this, do assessments of networks. And the other thing that I thought so interesting is that we no longer, it is an interconnected world. It really is interconnected and we have to forge these relationships from institution to institution to institution because cybersecurity it's not just one body's business. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to be involved. And I think we all recognize that the Caribbean is in a very vulnerable position and we have to work together on this. And, and the more we can have these sort of discussions, what, what typically happens is the, the techie people get together and talk the techie things. Mm -hmm. or, and, and there's no, no reference to, I'm glad Bevel raised it, the policy issues or the commercial issues, you have to have really fora that could address the issue in ways that are meaningful to the various stakeholders. Yes, you need the techie, the techie meetings and you need your, your, your academic meetings, and you, but they all are interrelated. And so you need to create fora where these things could be discussed on a, on a holistic basis. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to um, give panelists now 30 seconds to give their last comments, and then we will bring this session to an end. So let me start with um, Reynold. Uh, thank you, Shannon, uh, to give me, uh, thank you to Isaac and also CBU to give me the opportunity um, uh, to talk about what is happening right now in Haiti in terms of uh, securing BGP and also uh, the content we are putting in the IXP. And uh, I would take the opportunity also to launch an invitation to the audience because uh, this year, uh, it's uh, the e 2 tech year in Haiti. It's uh, the, the short trade about uh, technology, uh, energy, green energy, and also uh, environment. Uh, but uh, it seems that this year, there will be uh, some, um, uh, 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 some uh, uh, problem in the agenda because uh, the, 
the, the, sh the trade show, it will be from uh, May 15 to 17. And uh, the next day, that will be the LACMI conference in Peru, in Lima. Uh, I, I know it will be uh, very challenging for some of you to make uh, 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 both, but uh, I extend to my invitation to all of you. And I know, Shannon, you'll be there with us. Merci pour la invitation. <laughs> <laughs> D'accord. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, um, Marlon, please, 30 seconds. Um, thanks. Um, I have a fear, and, and the, the fear is this. It, um, it could be a wrong impression, but our society is such that we react to something as opposed to you know, listening to the voices that we've been saying this for years, that we need to do something about it. Um, I'm not really sure that is the way to go, but our culture is that maybe we need to show probably the campus that here what? Break it and let's see how much would run until you start screaming. How long you scream for? Thank you, Marlon. Steve? Um. Um, how I see the, um, the, the internet economy has become a critical part of all the islands, regional um, economies right now. And we need to see it as a precious um, commodity that needs to be protected. And security, and uh, well, specifically securing BGP, it has to be one of the priorities that we encourage, um, we, we talk about until our ISPs see it as a priority. Because in most cases, they, they, they don't see it as a priority because nobody kind of makes nice about it. And from a technical point of view, especially in the technical community and probably in Cardinal, we, we, we will start to actually trumpet this thing over and over again until they, we work for, for ISPs, we work for people who work, who, who work for ISPs, and talk among ourselves and bring it up to high enough level so that people see it as a, a, as a commercial interest, as a, as a business decision that they have to protect and shield along with everything else. So we can no longer be ignorant and hope for the best. Okay, or react. In most cases, oh, I get hacked. And then, <laughs> then there's a whole flurry of, of activity. No, begin to hear what people are saying years in advance and actually put the measures and the mechanism in place to protect the asset. Thank you. Bevel? I actually believe people, are, people hear best when they see. And um, I, I, I think the, the opportunities before us as a technical community, I know we have, uh, and I applaud the, the, the support from this, the CTU. I know, and I can speak strongly for Caribnog, uh, that we intend to demonstrate um, just how important it is to have secure networks across the region. But part of that demonstration and part of that site for hearing is being more open about the kinds of attacks that are taking place within the region. That's something we haven't spoken about. Um, and I want to just leave that um, with you, that if, if there is a greater consciousness of the nature of the threat, there is likely to be a greater response to the threat. And I, that applies at the University of the West Indies level, where some of the incidents have been pretty much suppressed to some of the larger institutions and organizations that have been uh, essentially sitting on um, just how extreme the, the, the environment has been uh, in the recent past uh, to some of these network attacks. If those, are, those things are exposed, I think technical community is waiting, willing and able uh, to come up with an appropriate response once the investment and support is there. Thank you. Thank you, Bevel. I think um, we have been, especially in the Caribbean, we have been talking for a while. So we know exactly what our challenges are. And I think, um, I think we should be focusing this year to, for, for some more actions and to, to, to get things done. So we, we know what our challenges are and we should find some way how to indeed to addressing them. So um, with that, I would like to close this session. Let's take a 15 minutes break and then we'll proceed with the program. Thank you.